evening. We are all storytellers of one kind or another. Some of us are captivating, some are dull. <laughs> sometimes we tell true stories, sometimes we invent, sometimes we lie. And we are also the audience for stories every single day. They take the form of parables, myths, plays, or songs, gossip, literature, and now media of all kinds. They have existed in our culture since the beginning. But why? Why? That's what we'll be talking about tonight in some depth. From the story side and the science side, and I think it's going to be fascinating. But first, to begin, to put us in the mood, a story. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in wel welcoming members of the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, my name is John. We are all members of the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. We're very excited to be here for you tonight. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do... Uh, how many people here have been to the Upright Citizens Brigade? Just clap. We can't see you. Nice. Uh, what we're going to do right now is a very mini version of uh, the long-running show ASCAT. Have any of you guys uh, seen ASCAT ever? Awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, what's going to happen is uh, we're going to get a suggestion from you guys. I'm going to then tell a story that is inspired by that suggestion. And then when I'm done, these guys are going to get up and improvise scenes inspired by the story that I tell. Do you got it? You'll get it. It's really easy. <laughs> um, so, uh, so to get started, why doesn't someone who, uh, anyone at all, shout out any suggestion you want? I heard eggshells first. Eggshells. Okay, eggshells. Eggshells reminds me of eggs, which I don't like to eat. Um, <laughs> this is improvised, not planned. You're surprised. Um, <laughs> so, um, eggshells. I remember um, in science class, we had to, um, in high school, um, my, uh, we had to do, make, make atoms out of eggs, which uh, I hated. Um, but... Uh, Oh, uh, one time in science class, here's the story I'll tell. Um, you guys are science people, right? Um, so I had an older sister and an older brother, and I sort of ha I suffered from that problem where, like, I, they went before me wherever I went in life. And so, like, I would show up to school to people like, you're just like your brother, you're just like your sister. And my brother was obnoxious, and so was my sister. So I, uh, I sort of suffered for their sins. And uh, I was also obnoxious, too, though. Um, and I, had, I sort of acted like you know, a sullen teenager, like, oh, the weight of the world is on my shoulders, and I have to suffer this burden of older siblings. So uh, one day I decided I was going to prove to my entire high school that I was my own person, and I was not my brother or my sister. So what I decided to do was one day go to school wearing just pajamas, mitch, 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 mitch shoes that didn't match. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then uh, my plan was to dye my hair green. Uh, what I did to, to do that, I just took mousse. This was the 80s. And um, I put uh, green food coloring in it. But then when I put it in my hair, it turned my hair blue. So I was like, ha-ha, this will show the world. Take that. Um, it, this happened to be the day in science class where we were going to figure out our own blood type. So we had to like prick our fingers and do all that stuff. And what I did not realize is that I'm one of those people where if I try to get a shot or prick my finger, uh, my body shuts down. So uh, I was in class and I was like trying to do the thing and I just started getting very wo woozy and sort of like, and I was like, I think I need to go get some water. So I was walking out with a friend of mine and I just passed out. And uh, so my friend, a girl, uh, um, she just like started freaking out. You know how girls do. They just... Uh, <laughs> They just, you know, she just started yelling and screaming. So, like, all my teachers came around, and then they, like, they were putting um, paper towels on my forehead to, like, cool me down, but I had food coloring in it. So, like, my face then, like, literally turned green. And they were all like, what is going on? So um, then uh, they called an ambulance, and I was taken to the emergency room of the hospital. Um, and it just so happens, I don't want to brag, uh, but my grandfather's a doctor, so I was like rushed right into the hospital and just sort of like lying there and they were just like, are you okay? What's wrong? We're very concerned. Your skin turned a different color. Um, and they're like, uh, did someone change you into pajamas when you got here? Like, uh, and what happened to your shoes? And so uh, it was a very, uh, uh, I showed them and no one ever mistook me for my older brother or sister ever again. Thank you guys very much. There you go. <laughs> 
Uh, sir, sir, no, 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 allow me. Since we're friends, let me take you to the real hospital. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. No, no. Uh, we walk through this carpeted secret doorway. Oh, wow. Ah, uh, oh, hi. This is my friend Bert. Oh, welcome to the special hospital for oh. special people. Wow, oh, thank you. I, I normally I go to the public hospital with oh. the, you know, people. The, the riffraff. Or yeah, the riffraff. Yeah. <laughs> Cognac. Thank you. There you go. You know, all I did was I uh, spilled some uh, green food coloring on my pants. Oh. I don't need any actual medical treatment. You never know. It could be poisonous green food coloring, right, Chad? <laughs> We've had several incidents of poisoned green food really? coloring. Yes. <laughs> when you're dealing with extra rich people, you often get poisoned things that shouldn't be poisoned. Yeah. <laughs> wow, is that a diamond IV? Yes, yes this is. is a diamond IV. Yes, oh. Would you like to try out just a little bit? Sure, but won't the di the tiny diamonds disrupt my blood flow no, and no, no, make no. my heart fail? You'd think that, but it I don't doesn't. Know. It feels like it's the same thing as putting an air bubble in your... Oh, yes. boy. You feel stronger. I do. Smarter. I do. Better looking. <gasps> Run through it, run through it. Ooh, those diamonds really cut up the heart. Yeah. Yes. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yes. It feels yeah. good. Uh, all right, class, I got the roster here. Uh, let's see, we got uh, Drew Johnston. Yes, welcome. Hi. John Murray. Hi. Yes, yep. hi. And Anthony Hamnick, are you related to... I'm your Dave? son. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I know you told me not to tell you anything, I, yeah, but I'm I, your son. Uh, look, I don't, I don't want... Uh, just give me a... Why are you uh, explaining it to them? I, well, explain okay, it to me. Right. I know, I'll explain. Look, I don't want anyone to know that we're, we're related. Um, Why? Are you going to be as irritating as your dad? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm no. irritating? You're horribly irritating. You are really irritating. irritating. You're really dad, irritating. you're totally I'm, irritating. Okay. Well, you know, I listen, I pride myself on being a cool teacher. Oh. Uh, it's, it's something, and look, I teach English, yeah. all right? Come on, that's a cool no, stuff. It's not. No, it's no. And the fact that you try to wear a leather jacket to compensate for it makes it worse. Hey, yeah. I wear a leather jacket because I ride a motorcycle on Sundays, mm. all right? Dad. No, what are you, listen, Fonzie? Yeah, what are you, Come on, Dad? Man. Like, sounds like a real that? Fonzie scheme to yeah. me. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> I mean a Fonzie scheme. I've been I'm waiting a real to cool say that guy. for Come a while. On. Leather jacket, a motorcycle, I think I got this going on, all right? Dad, maybe if you talk contemporary lit, that'd be cool, but, you what, know. What, classical lit's not cool? No way, I'll Dad. tell you what's cool. Letters in scarlet coloring, that's cool. <laughs> are you ta are, is that a way circular way to get to the scarlet letter? Yes, is that what it you're... is. <laughs> Boys, I have some bad news. I'm going to leave the both of you because you're so irritating. What? Yes. Yeah. No! No! No, please! Stop it! No! Uh, so, anyway, um, I, I just wanted to... Uh, right? I wanted to let you know that you're, we, we can't seat you. Uh, you're both wearing pajamas. Uh, this is a five-star uh, restaurant, and it, it, it's just, it's just rude. Oh, we're... I mean... <laughs> We, 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 uh, we, uh, we, we understand, we understand. We, we, we don't want to cause a we, scene. We don't want to cause a we, We're in a house fire. We, we were in a house fire. We're in a house fire. Deal. Okay. We just let me... Uh, it's not a big deal. We're, no, we're, 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 we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. I think that's the most important yeah, that's thing. That's right. That's, that's right. what everybody always says. Everyone that's, says it. We're okay. We're, we're fine. Okay. You're, uh, I was totally unaware that you were in a house fire. I, I'm very well, sorry. Why would you know? I mean, I wouldn't know. We smell like charred sofa. Maybe that would be a clue. Maybe. I, I, this is on me. I'm, I'm very not sorry. I'm bald on one side. <laughs> <laughs> I, There's a reason that both my hands are just charred lumps that are I, hanging off my wrist. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very sorry. Viva, I couldn't help but over here. Shouldn't you maybe go to the hospital or something instead of coming to a fancy... We can't afford to go to the rich hospital. Oh. We can't do it. No. no we can't oh, you can't it. afford to go to the rich hospital? And we refuse to go to the okay. poor hospital. Well, you probably... Well, because we're Americans. Yes, that makes sense. Totally so we sense. just hope we go to the rich hospital and ignore the poor hospital. Yes. yes. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Very true. But still, charred hands. I don't know. You're acting like babies now. I... She's... I'm... She's doing an imitation of my charred hands. Exactly. 
you know, imitation is the best form of flattery when you have body deformities. I think flattery is something you definitely need. It's true. <laughs> I feel far more confident now that, that she did that. So, uh, see? okay, well, maybe. So uh, please let us sit down. We would love to. <laughs> What's wrong with you? What, How you dare you? I'll sue this restaurant. No, I was trying. I will sue this restaurant. I was trying to relate. I was trying to flatter you what? by being a cripple. You are not in a oh, oh, my God. God. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. What are you doing? What I'm, is wrong with you? I'm You're trying to relate to them. Oh, you're screwing it up horribly. No, stop doing it. Stop it. Stop it. You should have said it was stop a it. cat Goodness. impersonation or something. Yes. It, it would oh, be a fairly sorry. Very poor well, I'm going to turn you away. After you did that now, I have to let you in. Thank yeah. you. Guys, look, I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna be fine. I, I can I can do it. I can take my blood. It's not a big deal, okay? Alright? Look, you don't need to take your own blood. No, I can do it. I can do it. Don't worry. Don't worry. I would really like it if you didn't take your own blood. No, I can, I can do it. <laughs> You'd be doing us all a favor if you didn't take your own blood. Yeah. TJ from hmm. Texas, I'm gonna do it. Look, <laughs> we're in the I, we're we're in a DMV and I know you don't know your blood type. I just I got you can do it. It's, but Trust you me. can't do the chemistry I'm in do here. It. Yeah, we a, all dropped what we were doing at our own desk, came over and we saw this going on. No, right no, no. Yeah, you've got more attention at the DMV than anyone has ever gotten. <laughs> yeah. You have three people we're, all paying attention to you, right? Really here. focused on you. We're, you know, that line we have ignored, I, and that's I, far from the course. Guys, I know how hard your job is, all right? Mm -hmm. I just want to help you. I want to make this easy. I'm going to take my own blood, okay? I'm just going to take my blood take so I can blood. do it, okay? Okay? All and right. hey, guys, thanks. Thank you, all right? For what? For helping, for, us, for helping me out, for taking the extra time. We're not helping not you, we're helping observing you. you. No, and by observing you, we're altering the experiment. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh, oh. God. All right. All oh. right. All right. Hey, no, the, the, right. you're oh, making this a person scene. This person is hyperanemic. This is hyperanemic. Clearly. Okay. This blood's spraying I know everywhere. This I know that. Please. You know, okay. it's the okay. index Look, artery. Please. This please. Please. Sort of shake up my look. Just shake up your look? Yeah. Well, you know what, Phil? You're an accountant, all right? <laughs> Thank you, everyone! You did it, citizens for being there. Thank you. So, storytelling can just, uh, bubble up out of us, or some of us, anyway. But it comes from within, which brings us back to our question, why? Why do we have a primal urge to tell stories? What purpose do they serve for us as individuals or as a species? Do they help us survive? What happens in the brain when we tell stories? Does storytelling play an evolutionary role? We have Three distinguished scientists here to discuss this, along with two of this country's master storytellers, writers and scientists, both dedicated to mystery and meaning. Please help me welcome them. 
Our first participant teaches English at Washington and Jefferson College and writes books at the intersection of art and science. He spent the last few years considering the evolutionary power of storytelling. He's the author of The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. Please welcome Jonathan Gottschall. Our next participant has written more than 50 novels, 30 short story collections, and eight volumes of poetry. She's won the National Book Award and been nominated for the Pulitzer three times. She is also a distinguished professor of humanities at Princeton University, where she teaches creative writing. Please welcome Joyce Carol Oates. Next up, another novelist and short story writer. He won the Pulitzer for his novel, Middlesex. He is also a professor of creative writing at Princeton, and he may be the only American writer to appear on a larger-than-life billboard in Times Square. Welcome, Jeffrey Eugenides. Our next participant is Professor Emeritus of Cognitive Psychology at the University of Toronto where he conducted research on the cognitive and emotional processes of writing and reading fiction. He's also published three novels. Please welcome Keith Oatley. And our final participant is Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Science at Yale University. His work includes studying how children and adults use fiction to understand the physical and social world. Welcome, Paul Bloom. <laughs> Welcome to all of you. I'm the moderator, I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> uh, you, you have authority over us. <laughs> uh, I, I'm looking forward to this, both as a, as a professional story person, but also as the parent of five children uh, who are seemingly hardwired for stories, particularly stories out loud. Uh, and in fact, uh, up on Cape Cod where, uh, where we live, I, I woke up this morning and my son, Mason, uh, who's about just turned three, pulled at my arm, came in and pulled at my arm while I was in bed and woke me up from a sound sleep. And he said fittingly for this evening, Daddy, you got any good stories for me? <laughs> So I want to talk, start from the science side and encourage you to ask questions of one another across the, the, the border here. But Jonathan, tell us first, just to give us all, uh, we can all maybe get a lay of the land here in terms of this intersection between science and story and the study of so story by science. What made you decide to start studying storytelling through the lens of science? Um, I was frustrated with the progress we were making in the humanities um, from, from in literary studies. There's, we've been studying these questions for a long, long time, kind of chasing our tails, not making a lot of progress. And I started to think, is there a better, mo better model for acquiring knowledge? And the th model that came to mind was science. Science is the best method humans have figured out for figuring things out. Um, and so I uh, wanted to see how far I could get in my own scholarly work, my work in literary studies and the humanities, uh, by basically just going into the sciences and ransacking them and taking what I could. And Paul, uh, how, how do you pro approach storytelling, or for that matter, imagination in your scientific exploration? Well, from a similar approach, I'm very interested in pleasure and the pleasures of everyday life. And some pleasures are reasonably straightforward from an evolutionary sense, like the pleasure we get from food and pleasure we get from sex and from social interaction. But then some pleasures are quite mysterious. And I think stories, as we'll see, pose certain very interesting mysteries from the standpoint of pleasure, from the standpoint of evolution, and from the standpoint of development. And I think that by studying these mysteries, by studying stories seriously, um, we can get some real insights into how the mind works. And Keith, uh when, when do you think storytelling became something science would or could start to study? Well, um, I think that's an interesting question too. I mean, obviously, uh, people who put storytelling together with psychology um, 
There were people 2,300 years ago. Aristotle, for instance, did that. But in the modern period, uh, I think Jerry Bruner uh, made a real advance in, in uh, a book he wrote in 1986 called Actual Minds, Possible Worlds, in which he said, really, there are two quite separate ways of thinking uh, one of them he called paradigmatic, and that is about uh, giving an account uh, point by point about how the physical world works. But then what narrative is about, very interestingly, is about what people are up to. And so uh, Jerry gave this very, uh, I think, formative and important uh, characterization of narrative as... Um, human intentions and their vicissitudes. So um, this, I think, puts the whole idea of stories into, uh, into the right category because, well, fiction, for instance, you know, it means something made. What people really mean is something made up. Um, and, of course, the opposite of that is fact. So that's not very easy to work with. Uh, but if instead of thinking about its construction, we think about what the subject matter is, people and what they're up to, then it makes it possible to ask scientific questions about it. And, and, and I think that illustrates the immediate puzzle, which is it's no mystery why people would want facts about the real world, who's sleeping with whom, where the food is, where, you know, there's a gossip is, is a natural appetite and a powerful one, and it makes sense. But why would we want facts about people who we full well know don't exist? and events that don't exist. <laughs> Why would we spend our money, spend our time pursuing those things? And that's just an extraordinary puzzle. Uh, so we're immersed, really, in a kind of bath of stories of all kinds, from gossip to fiction to useful information presented as story, uh, TV, commercials, songs, the Bible, children's bedtime. Uh, how, how universal are stories across culture and across time? Well, it's pretty amazing to, to I mean, if you could get in a time machine and travel anywhere in human history, or, and you could travel across borders, across cultures, across historical eras, you'd go there and you'd find the same amazing thing, that their stories are just like ours. Uh, there'd be cultural variations, of course, but for the most part, you'd find that story is for them as it is for us. It's about characters facing problems, striving to overcome them, the same kind of uh, obsessions, the same kind of structures. And it's, it, it emerges naturally in children. It blooms naturally in children. So one thing that this, this panel is kind of weird, the science of story, it seems like a paradox, an oxymoron. Uh, but it's not. Uh, science of uh, 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 storytelling, fiction, is as natural to human beings as opposable thumbs, as upright posture. Um, and to make progress in understanding it, science really needs to be more in on this game than it is currently. Isn't there a distinction between, between fiction and narrative, though? I mean, you can, you can have narrative yeah. with facts, and I, I assume the same things are going on in people's brains um, as they listen to a so-called true, true story or, or a made-up one. Can you tell differences when you, when you analyze that? Well, I think that's a very good question. The re I think one of the real troubles is there isn't a very good word in English for uh, this object, which is a carefully constructed uh, narrative, uh, which is actually about people and what they're up to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, fiction comes close, but... You know, what about biography? Uh, narrative, well, the trouble is, as, as you were saying, I mean, you narrate what you were doing today, and that isn't the same as what you do and what Joyce does. So I think we don't quite have uh, a term for this particular kind of mental object, which is a carefully constructed thing that you as a novelist can give to someone else, which is actually a piece of the human mind that you can pass over, uh, and the person can take that into their own mind. Um, but what we're supposed to talk about today is this made-up narrative, not, not any other kind of narrative. We're well, what I'm saying is the made-up... I mean, I'm happy about that. No, no, no. The made-upness of it, it seems to me, is, you know, it's not without interest, but it's not central. I think, I think if we're going to be scientific about it, you say, all right, now what's central to this activity? Um, and I think what Jerry Bruner was saying, uh, what Jonathan was saying, uh, uh, what Paul is saying is that 
the central issue is actually stories are about people and what they're up to. So we human beings are the most social species, right? So our world isn't about, uh, you know, how things are constructed by and large. It's actually about what all of us are up to. And so in a way, it's not completely surprising that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about that in order to uh, see if we can get it down. We don't quite get it down, <laughs> but we can make progress. It, it, it's an excellent distinction to make between made-up stories and real stories. And, but it might be that the solution to the problem of stories is, the, is that our mind blurs the two. So one reasonably plausible theory to me is that we've evolved an interest in how people interact and everything. And what stories are are what biologists call super stimulus. Their fictional stories are exactly crafted to perfectly push all our buttons that we're looking for in the real world. They're like, like cheesecake has been constructed to push our, our taste buttons, and porn has been constructed to push our sexual responses. F the fictional stories that, that you guys create are, whether you know it or not, exactly crafted to, to, for a creature like us to... Not everyone would agree, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> that's the aim. That's the aim. Let me jump from the species to the individual for just a second. Joyce, uh, why did you choose, or did you choose at all, to create stories? Well, I was just going to say that storytelling in itself is a very neutral activity. I mean, it's neither good nor bad. A book, um, a television program, a newspaper, these are just sort of vessels for some sort of content. And I think that storytelling can be very beautiful and very elegant, the most... The great operas of Mozart, for instance, are wonderful vehicles for many different kinds of meaning. But there are very negative kinds of storytelling. Uh, paranoid schizophrenics have their stories. Sometimes they publish books like Mein Kampf, you know, and many people are taken in by them. <laughs> and there are very um, wicked stories in the world that people fall, fall under the spell of. So I think when you talk about storytelling here in the, the panel, it seems that it's f weighted to being a very positive thing. You think it's na natural and necessary and good, but I'm not so sure that that's actually the case. Well, I think one of the things one can do is, uh, as scientists, we can take something like that and then turn it into a question. So, I mean, for instance, I work in a small research group in, in Toronto, really, there are just three of us, uh, Raymond Ma, Maya G. Kitchen and, and me, and we uh, took that uh, idea and then turned it into a question. So people have thought that stories are good for one uh, for thousands of years, but perhaps, as you say, they're not. And so what we then did is to say, all right, now... Uh, can we actually measure the effects that stories uh, have on on people when they when they read them? And um, so I think we're starting to make some headway with that. I'd like to see an MRI of a brain reading Anna Karenina against a brain reading Mein Kampf, and see if there's any any similarity, or if one one has, is full of sludge. And, uh, <laughs> One is lighting up like a Christmas tree. Or one looking at some cartoons <laughs> or, you know, reading silly things. I mean, well, what the research the shows, I think... The brain has to light up no matter what you're doing. Yeah. So Might be, yeah. I mean, it does light up. Does, I mean, I mean, we, we know how to answer, way, answer yeah. the question for extremes. We know that some stories have had a positive effect. Uncle Tom's Cabin is credited by many as ending slavery in, in the United States. We also know some stories have horrible negative effects, and we know that although the correlational question that you're interested in, the, the causal question, is extremely interesting, we know that, that say, the officers of the Third Reich were famously literate. They, were, they, they read all the time as, they, as, you know, as, as they, they delivered the Holocaust. So stories are certainly not an immunization against awful behavior. Or do you think otherwise? No, there, I mean, I think, I think the research shows that stories are powerful. They're a powerful tool, um, and, and they very much depend upon the intentions of the wielder. Uh, so there's plenty of great historical examples of fiction changing the world for the better. You know, Lincoln uh, says to Harriet Beecher Stowe when she visits the White House, so you're the little woman who wrote this, the book that made this great war. 
Um, but then there's other examples of, you know, Birth of a Nation, uh, was based on a novel called The Klansman, where it had, you know, horrible uh, social uh, effects. So what, what, what the research shows, and then some of the micro-level research that people like Paul are doing, shows that people are, we, we kind of have this feeling that we go into fiction, it's escapist, it doesn't change us very much, we walk away unscathed, we had a nice time. Um, but, it, but, but a lot of the research is suggesting, this is new research, and it needs a lot more replication, but it's suggesting that story changes us. It's working on us all the time. It's modifying the way we think. We're sort of in a trance when we're in a story. Uh, and we're highly suggestible. So if a film, a, a TV show, Joe Biden got in a lot of trouble, or like, got made fun of a lot for suggesting that will and grace might be the reason that uh, for massive changes in our attitudes towards homosexuals. But that's, that's actually one of the dominant theories in the social sciences, is that... It was actually the musical cabaret. That's really what yeah. it <laughs> But the idea is that positive portrayals of, and hey, you say, hey, Will's just like me, Jack's just like me, I like these people. Uh, I, don't, I don't want them to be unhappy. I, I, I want to root for these people and, and see them do well. So. And there's evidence that that's true. In India and Africa, the experiments have been done where you look at villages that get cable TV and those that don't. And the ones that do get cable TV have far more progressive attitudes towards women, far more liberal attitudes, because the TV they get is soap operas from the big city, mm -hmm. where they have more liberal attitudes and better attitudes towards mm -hmm. women. So, so we know, and, and these are very carefully controlled studies, that it can have that sort of powerful, like sometimes for evil, but it can have it for good. That's very, very compelling. Jonathan, are there special skills a human being needs to, uh, to have to, to be able to grasp a story or to tell a story? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, well, I, normal humans are, are all born with the capacity to tell and interpret stories. And we'll do an experiment later on where from very minimal cues, people will form a very, very rich uh, and complicated, complex uh, story. Um, there are uh, mental conditions uh, like autism, uh, which is a sort of, uh, it's been described as a, a disorder of the imagination where uh, autistic children are incapable of uh, pretend play. They, they don't, they're not attracted to it. They don't want to go to the land of make-believe. Uh, is it hard to put themselves in someone else's shoes? That's that's one of the ideas, yeah, yeah, and uh, so and adults with autism also have no uh, craving for fiction. They don't understand it, they don't get it. Uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum you have uh, disorders like schizophrenia, as you were saying, or, or, or bipolar, where it can be seen as a sort of story madness, this wild overproduction of narrative uh, that really makes a person uh, quite miserable, but can re result in great literature. <laughs> uh, you know, Moby Dick was written when uh, Melville was really quite sick uh, and, and manic, uh, and there's a really good chance that, you know, without, uh, but for Melville's miserable mental illness, it was really making him miserable, um, we would not have had the greatest of all the great American novels. I want to move to the neuroscience of storytelling and just saying, but do any other species tell stories or approximate the telling of stories? Not as so far as we know. I mean, it's possible the Not dolphins are doing it, but we can't understand their language. <laughs> <laughs> dolphins are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> My dog, Sam, is oh. a coward and a weakling in real life, but when he battles his stuffed animals, um, I'm pretty sure that he's having a rich imaginative experience. He's seeing himself as the hero of a doggy epic. Uh, he's Buck in The Call of the Wild. Um, but I think, I think the real answer is you have to have a very baggy and loose definition of story to try to cram other species in it. I mean, as uh, writers, and, writers and artists are inclined to be interested in, well, anecdotal evidence about the pow power of story. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about the neuroscience in a second. But could we have another bit of story to start? Uh, we want to set the tone, thinking about this idea of what it takes to fall in to a good story. Uh, so, Jeffrey, well, Janet. Jay, you were talking about your son waking up at 5.30, so I thought I would read um, something from the first book, first page of the first book I ever wrote, which oh, is as childish as I can get. Um, <laughs> on the morning the last Lisbon daughter took a turn at suicide, it was Mary this time, and sleeping pills like Therese. The two paramedics arrived at the house knowing exactly where the knife drawer was and the gas oven and the beam in the basement from which it was possible to tie a rope. They got out of the EMS truck, as usual, moving much too slowly in our opinion. And the fat one said under his breath, this Aunt TV, folks, this is how fast we go. He was carrying the heavy respirator and cardiac unit past the bushes that had grown monstrous, and over the erupting lawn, tame and immaculate, 13 months earlier when the trouble began. 
Cecilia, the youngest, only 13, had gone first, slitting her wrists like a stoic while taking a bath. And when they found her afloat in her pink pool, with the yellow eyes of someone possessed and her small body giving off the odor of a mature woman, the paramedics had been so frightened by her tranquility that they had stood mesmerized. But then Mrs. Lisbon lunged in, screaming, and the reality of the room reasserted itself. Blood on the bath mat. Mr. Lisbon's razor sunk in the toilet bowl, marbling the water. The paramedics fetched Cecilia out of the warm water because it quickened the bleeding and put a tourniquet on her arm. Her wet hair hung down her back, and already her extremities were blue. She didn't say a word, but when they parted her hands, they found the laminated picture of the Virgin Mary she held against her budding chest. That was in June, the fish fly season, when each year our town is covered by the flotsam of those ephemeral insects. Rising in clouds from the algae in the polluted lake, they blacken windows, coat cars and street lamps, plaster the municipal docks, and festoon the rigging of sailboats, always in the same brown ubiquity of flying scum. Mrs. Shear, who lives down the street, told us she saw Cecilia the day before she attempted suicide. She was standing by the curb in the antique wedding dress with the shorn hem she always wore, looking at a thunderbird encased in fish flies. You better get a broom, honey, Mrs. Shear advised. But Cecilia fixed her with her spiritualist's gaze. They're dead, she said. They only live 24 hours. They hatch, they reproduce, and then they croak. They don't even get to eat. And with that, she stuck her hand into the foamy layer of bugs and cleared her initials, C.L. Why didn't anybody applaud when I spoke? <laughs> <laughs> so it Socks. activated all our senses, and we saw things and met people and heard and smelled things and... Keith, what happens, what gets activated in the mind when we fall into a narrative like that? Well, I, I think it's very interesting. And I think if we reflect on this, uh, it starts to bring together some of the discussion we have. I think the first thing to say, and it was characteristic of your piece, is that uh, stories don't, on the whole, seek to persuade people. So, you know, you talked about Mein Kampf and, you know, uh, attempts to get people to act in some particular way. Whereas your story there isn't an attempt to persuade people. It's an invitation to say, all right, can you understand this person, Cecilia? And that, I think, is the first and most important clue as to what fiction is really all about. We human beings, because we're so social have to make mental models of all of the people we, we uh, meet. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to interact with them. So the issue isn't really, you know, whether it's factually true or, or you know, whether some kinds of fiction uh, produce terrible things. It's do stories actually have an effect in enabling people to make better mental models of each other? Uh, able to empathize with people in these situations, able to understand people socially. And so, you see, when we start to think about it in that way, which, are, as I say, I would, I would talk about as, right, what are the scientific questions then? Is it the case that we can understand people better if we read more novels? So in our research group, I think we've been the first to show that, yes, there is an association of that kind. And you've taken uh, pictures of the brain in well, um, absorbing that information. Uh, the brain, uh, yes. Um, we, the brain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my colleague, uh, Raymond. He's done uh, a, a kind of analysis, which is called a meta-analysis, in which he's looked at... Uh, two different kinds of things. One of them is which parts of the brain are activated when uh, a person tries to understand someone else, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what kind of person they are. Okay? <laughs> and it turns out there is a network, which he calls a mentalizing network, because we're trying to understand people in mental terms. What are they thinking and feeling? And it includes parts of the frontal lobes here, 
It includes a part at the back of the cingulate cortex. The cingulate cortex is sort of in the middle here and goes back here, so part at the back of the cingulate cortex. And part of the uh, area uh, between the temporal and parietal lobes on the side. And this is a network um, that we use for understanding people. And guess what? That network is activated when people are reading stories. Right? So these so yellow patches here, then, are the places of overlap between uh, the network for understanding people and the uh, places that are activated when, when you're reading a story. What about when you're watching a film, something visual? Is yes. Well, I think that's a very interesting question, and there, there are people working on this. It turns out that the... But you haven't compared them. You haven't compared well, them. I haven't. Melanie Green um, has done some comparisons of this kind. No, I'm just curious because many people are much more intensely engaged with the visual than they are with, with the linear reading. Yes. But you see, the real understanding isn't, okay, what does that person look like, but what's going on in their mind. And so film and, store and you know, print stories, it turns out, are not that different in this respect. You still are having to make Even though you construct the pictures yourself when you read? Sorry? Even though when you read, you're building the pictures no, and, that, and activating the senses? That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And, and of course, one of the things that one... Uh, that writers do is to write in such a way that people can indeed imagine things uh, vividly. And there's been some studies of, of, of that as well. Uh, but from a, from I, I, a writer's point of view, writers are interested in language yes. rather than just telling a story like you might tell a story in a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So the language can be very elliptical, very rich and very poetic, very slow. You know, an opening paragraph by Dickens, a quintessential Dickens, can be a beautiful set piece about London. But there's no story yet. It, it's the language that draws people in. So storytelling, I think, in itself is more of a skeletal thing where there's an actual story. Whereas with what Jeffrey read from The Virgin Suicides, it seems to me as a fellow writer that it's going to be a kind of circular story that will go back and forth in time. And there will be a story, but the story is subordinate to the language and to the perspective. And the strategy of the writer is not to tell the story directly because it would be over with in nine pages. You know, you have, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a mystery story where if you, if you do it yeah. too quickly, it's all over with in, in nine pages. But you have to sort of draw it out for a certain aesthetic length. So it's, it's more than just storytelling, but it's, it's an enhancement and embellishment, and sort of, but not unlike music. And, and that actually, I mean, I find this work interesting and significant, but in some ways it illustrates the limits, not inherent limits, but just limits of where we are now in a science of stories. Because I listened to your story and I loved it. My, I made a mental note to buy the book when I leave here to see how, and it's, I'll, I'll just, we just pass over to mine. Um, now, and, and I don't doubt it would have lit up those parts of my brain. But I could have given you a story, and it would have been awful. People would have been rolling their eyes. It's about some guy and his dog, and I would make it up. And, it, and but that would have lit up those parts Same of the brain amount. too. So the difference between, and, and of course, it, in the end, if there's a difference we appreciate between your story and the story I would make up, it has to be represented in the brain. There has to be a psychological mm -hmm. uh, correspondence, mm -hmm. and it's something we can investigate. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but the difference isn't at the level of representing social interactions, just about every story, as you point out, would. Yeah. So we have to look elsewhere for why some stories give us intense pleasures and others don't. That's what I'm wondering. I mean, not knowing much about MRIs when I see them, like how precise a diagnostic is, is that? Does, is, does the brain always lighting up almost the same and there's little differences, or is it obvious to see that there's a huge difference between different activities in the brain? Well, it, it is a relatively blunt instrument. I think that that's true. Um, it's also true what... what what Paul is saying, but I think the way this field is going at the moment is that we can come at it from a number of different directions. So, uh, I mean, in, in our group, um, I think we found two kinds of effects. One of them is the one that we've just been talking about. So the more stories, fiction you read, then uh, the better you are at understanding people. And that doesn't matter too much whether this is, you know, Pulp Fiction or Jane Austen or, you know, J. 
Jeff, for you, Jenna, they, right? How do you know they're better? You, you tipped them after the exp experiment, took them to a restaurant, and saw if they got along with people? <laughs> what did you do to see that they had gained in understanding? Well, uh, a bit later on, yeah. when these pictures oh, come up, yeah. I'll, sh I'll show you one okay. of the tests that right. we, that we, that okay, we used. But, so we, we use two kinds of tests for, mm. for um, people's social understanding. But the, the other kind of study that we've been doing is um, what does this, uh, this relates to what you're saying. What does a story need to be like to move you and allow you to change within yourself? Right? Mm -hmm. And there it turns out whether the story is written by a real artist or you know, a, um, you know, a writer who isn't very good makes a big difference. And so, if, uh, I mean, the first story we, uh, we worked on here was a story by Chekhov, right? And we actually made a version which wasn't Chekhov. Um, yeah, easy to do. That was relatively <laughs> easy to do. Yeah. Relatively easy. But, 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 we managed to make it so that it is exactly the same length, exactly wow. the yeah. same reading difficulty had exactly the same information, and get this, people found it just as interesting, mm -hmm. although not as artistic. Read your check off. Pardon? Read your check off. Oh, we're coming to the check off yeah. in a moment. Well, in you a moment. brought him up. Yeah. But the, 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 the... He wants you to do it. Hmm? He wants you to do it now. Yeah, but that's a different <laughs> check off. Um, yeah. Right. Well, we can still talk about check off. <laughs> the, All right. The people who read the Chekhov story changed their personality a bit. Mm -hmm. Not in a persuasive way, but everybody changed in their own way. Per and this is that I think, permanent? A per sorry? permanent change? Sorry, I didn't... A permanent, permanent change. change? No, it was temporary uh, and short-term. I would think so. Um, but the Chekhov got, got a bigger <laughs> one, right? Yeah. Well, the thing is that science does go by small steps, I'm afraid. But one question, one question, I mean, again, this is very, very early in the research. Not many people are in on this game. And so one of the questions, uh, this is a very modest study. You, you, you say in your study that the re results are modest, the changes were modest, and they were short-lived. But the question is, what is the effect of constantly marinating yourself in fiction the way we do? Exactly. Because all of this, th these little doses of fiction that we're taking all day long, every day, our whole lives have a, a, a cumulative effect on, on personality. Well, well that, would, that would be our, yeah. our hypothesis, yes. So that, I think, then starts to address the kind of issue that you yeah. talked about. And what we found is that stories that people categorize as, as art uh, have this kind of effect and, and uh, uh, texts that uh, are not categorized in that way don't. But we're going to move now to the, maybe the most natural group of storytellers, uh, children, and um, almost from the time they begin to speak, they begin constructing narratives. So we have uh, for you all to watch uh, some of some children doing what they do best, which is make stuff up. <laughs> Once there was a family with two boys, one girl, and a mom and dad, and they were looking for a house to move into. They found this huge house that was like a mile long with a pool and a garden, and like it was a mansion, basically. So they asked the owner how much it was, and the owner just said, just take it, I can't take it anymore, and he ran off, and they didn't pay him anything. But then strange things started to happen. Faucets would go on and off, lights would go on and off, doors would open and close, and the mom and dad finally couldn't take it anymore. So they left a babysitter with the children, and the children dared the babysitter to go, to go in the closet with the door closed and the lights out. And the babysitter did not want to do this, definitely not, but she wanted to get a good payment, so she just went in the closet. She stayed there a minute until she opened the door, but it wouldn't open, it was locked. She looked behind her and there were, and there were five ghostly figures floating there. We had been locked in here and died, were killed. Now you shall be the same. They took a knife and cut off her arm. The woman was suffering. So the family tried to burn down the house. They tried and tried, but it would not burn down. So suddenly there was a pop, and all these people made of smoke started flying out. And they were cursing and screaming, you'll be sorry, we'll come back. And, and the family moved to another house, but little did they know what mysteries were hidden in that one. And that's the end of my story. 
There are different kinds of fairies. Some fairies are normal size. Some fairies are really tiny, like the size of my thumb. Some fairies don't know about that they're fairies for a long time, almost all their life, until they're 60 or something. Once you know that you're a fairy and you actually believe it, your wings start to grow. At least that's what I think. One thing that's really bad for fairies is the one way they can die is from disbelief. When a child stops believing in fairies, a fairy can die. One of the blinking fairies, they would say, clap if you believe in fairies. And then if you clap, it might save a fairy's life. I want to save a fairy. Sometimes online I search, are fairies real or something? And there are a lot of things that say yes, 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 and yes. Maybe one day I could be a fairy and Today I would guess to be one so I could tell you more about fairies. My story is called The Missing Pearl. It's about a boy named Matthew and he has to go through these tasks and then he has to go his first task is to go to Australia and then he went to his friends and then they just went on the ship and then Zeus came. He tried to throw a thunderbolt, but it sank instead. Then um, Poseidon just makes the wave go up and then down, and then the ship is now in midair, and Zeus controls the ship and flies it to somewhere else instead of Australia, because Zeus knows, and then he they believed Matthew about, like, Greek gods were real, and then they were. This is a big ice pop, and this is a little ice pop, and this is Cinderella, and this is Ariel, and this is a sleepy bee. Once upon a time, all the princesses ate ice cream. One ate chocolate, one ate vanilla. When they were mashing the ice cream, birds ate it, and they were so happy that the birds ate it. They finished the food, and then they had ice cream and cake. So they have five cakes. And they have five ice creams. And they have five ice pops. That's the robins. The robins were so sick that they went inside the doctor and they and they let and they sleep with the doctor. The doctor say, You're all better. Go away. I want to see you again next time. They went home and their nest and they sleep. And that's in my story. I want to talk to Paul, uh, who does a lot of work with kids. But first, I want to ask the, the, of our writers: Did stories start pouring out of you when you were little? Well, both of you. She's in charge of pouring out. Okay. <laughs> when I first began, before I could write, I would draw, and this reminded me of the sort of babbling, you know, kind of inspired nonsense that would sort of comes out of people. <laughs> and and with, with professional writers, uh, the impulse just continues, but the strategies are a little different. It's sort of this uh, energy, this, this strange confidence that what you're saying has some coherence and that anyone would want to hear it, you know. And so you're sort of drawing little cartoons. I was coloring in a coloring book, but I had chickens and cats who were walking around like people. And it just sort of reminded me of that. And I, th I really hope that my, f my first novels are not available anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed that the theme of this uh, last story was Alan Sherman's Hello, Mata, Hello, Fada. I don't know if you know that. Um, I, don't, I don't remember um, writing uh, lots of stories when I was a kid. I remember writing them and, and, and liking it, but... It was mainly wanting to be in an imaginative world that I liked. I loved to play make-believe um, longer, you know, at an age where it began to be embarrassing to want to play make-believe. And I, I, we, my family was in Detroit, and we moved to Maryland. And then when we moved back to Detroit, I still wanted to meet, make friends 
who wanted to make believe or play pretend. Um, and I couldn't find any, any, yet, any friend. And it was almost like I had a dirty secret that I would have to bring up with a certain friend if I thought they might want to pretend that we were somebody else. But that's where it began for me, not actually so much writing, but just imagining that I was somebody else and usually with someone else in the scene. I didn't want to do it alone because you wanted to construct this imaginative world with someone else so as to maybe believe it more. But that was certainly a, a big part of my character that probably led to my becoming a writer in the end. And then I think Jeffrey and I have at least one thing in common, a, sort of a fascination with a place, like you're writing about Gross Point. I lived in Detroit. And one of the motives for art, creating art is, is a feeling of homesickness, that you've lost something that's very powerful and haunting, but you can't quite get to it in your conscious life. So through your imagination, you're evoking this place. So you're writing about Gross Point, basically. It's sort of like the spirit, almost an in, in, invisible, impalpable spirit of a place that you're kind of evoking in the writing. That's one of the reasons that people write. That's why I write. Out of loneliness and homesickness, yeah. you're evoking that lost world. Yeah. And when James, they asked James Joyce if he was ever going to go back to Ireland or Dublin, he says, have I ever left? And he yeah, had lived there right. 30 years right. when he said that. Yeah, well, most of the Irish poets are writing about Ireland in, in the past. Well, how about kids who don't yet have the opportunity for nostalgia and homesickness? When do they switch on with story, and how does their impulse to story change? Well, children start telling stories, as you point out, from the very get-go. As soon as they have language, maybe even before, they start creating imaginary worlds and playing with them. And I think the stories that, that, that we just saw, they were, I thought they were wonderful stories. Um, the babysitter in the haunted house seemed to resemble Jeff's sort of style. You know, you know. Yeah, it was. Sorry. It was. I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to Joyce about bringing who? her to Princeton. I think she's going to be a great <laughs> student. Um, uh, and, and I think that they illustrate this, that what to me, I think, is the really interesting mystery of stories, which is perfectly illustrated in those examples we saw, which is there's no puzzle why we might enjoy stories of things that would be satisfying if, if we were to experience in real life. No puzzle why we might here enjoy happy people socializing, achieving goals, and so on. Pornography, as I said before, is no great puzzle. If you enjoy looking at sex in the real world, a visual simulation of it can be arousing, and so on. But the defining feature of, of many stories, and those stories in particular, is they involve bad things. They, you know, Jonathan sums it up in his wonderful book. He says, the core element that they share is trouble. Horrible things happening. It's, you would expect kids rationally to avoid their worst fears, but they confront them. They dive into them. And that's a real puzzle. And one solution to the puzzle, which, which Keith has emphasized in his work, and, 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 and many of us have thought about, I think all three of us might, are tempted by this, is that the stories serve as a form of safe practice. So there's horrible things in the world that, that we need to deal with. And just like play is often viewed by ethologists as a way of practicing for the future. You practice, in a, like play fighting. So when you have to do real fighting, you're ready. So we practice in our imaginations. We, we rush out our worst scenarios, play them over and over again in our heads, and maybe, just maybe, it makes us better prepared to deal with them. Would children who never heard stories make up stories? Aren't they basically mimicking things that they've heard? I'm just, I'm just curious whether you've done experiments you have children who are, to whom are told certain stories and some of the children are told other stories and see whether they mimic those stories or whether they make up something new. The answer is both. So there's no doubt at all that children will choose, will, will manipulate the forms of the stories that they tell based on the ones they hear. And even in those examples, we could often see some of the stories were familiar to us. They were based on things the children were hearing or were adopted, the clapping the hands for the fairies and so on. But based on some studies, not my own, of children raised in unusual populations, like children who had limited experience with, with adults and, and created their own language. That's some work by Susan Golden Meadow. Or children who were raised in very, very strict religious communities where storytelling was strongly discouraged or even not forbidden. Mm -hmm. As best we know, even in those societies, children will create their own stories. Yeah. I, I, I think this is a very interesting line of thinking, and I think... Uh, for evolutionary theory as well. I think stories grow out of play and you can see children uh, playing and as they're playing, uh, creating a joint story together. Don't you um, think they grow out, grow out of dreams too? Sorry? Don't you think stories grow out of dreams? 
Um, I think they can do, but what we I mean, if we just think about the, um, the steps from children, um, I mean, all children play, many other mammals play as well, um, and I think what's a, a worthwhile hypothesis is to ask, all right, are stories then, uh, you know, a somewhat more grown-up version of, of children's play? Um, and it has these qualities of fantasy uh, that we've been talking about. It has a quality of social interaction. It has a quality of solving problems that you didn't quite know that you were working on in the way that, for instance, uh, uh, rough-and-tumble play um, has the property of allowing you to both be affectionate and competitive with someone else. So I think it's an interesting hypothesis that, uh, and I, I, I think a very likely one. What's, what's interesting about it to me is, you know, we watched the Upright Citizens Brigade come on stage tonight and make believe. Yes. And we're so impressed with it. I was, I was shocked because we were all nervous before the show. These guys aren't nervous. And they're doing a high wire act. <laughs> they're making it up as they go along. Um, and in some ways, it's, in, it's incredibly impressive. And in other ways, it's just what my six-year-old daughter is doing all the time, making up stories and acting them out. It's completely natural. Uh, the, the few days before I left, uh, my, daughter had her, my six-year-old daughter had her uh, friend over. And... They, they, they hug, they say hello, and they immediately teleport into Wonderland. And they say, let's pretend that our parents are dead. <laughs> and, 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 and boom, I'm dead, devoured by tigers, as it turns out. And they're lost in this world where the providers are gone, the people who love them and care for them, the protectors are gone. Um, and they're walking through a tiger-haunted jungle. There's a tiger-haunted jungle. There's bad men. Uh, it's, Wonderland is not at all what we would predict it would be like if we were Martian literary scholars, Martian developmental psychologists. We would expect people to teleport into worlds where everything went well. And we, worlds we, we, of rainbows and unicorns, we don't find that at all. And we could ask that of adults, too. So quick poll. How many people here like being scared in movies, like horror movies or gory movies? Anybody? Okay, now keep your hands up. How many people like movies that make them cry sometimes with sad endings? Oh, a bunch and, of sad endings. And, and when you put those, so two, so on the face of it, you say, well, look, there's two things you want to avoid in life. It's fear and sadness. <laughs> but, but, and, and, and You can't and, have a night in New York without that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or New Haven, for that matter. <laughs> Even worse. Uh, <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> You can come to Princeton. <laughs> There's no but, fear. So, so you know, the, the, our appetite for them, you, again, you make a discovery in science when every rational thing predicts it should go one way, and it goes another way. And then you realize that some ways you've been thinking about the phenomena, in this case the mind, are mistaken. People like, under some circumstances, things like being afraid and being, and being sad. And, when and does that switch on, Paul? Because little kids don't, I mean, is there a point, and, and how do you study that, or... We've actually done there's some work I've been doing with a graduate student, Lily Giot, um, where what we do is we can't really show children scary movies for ethical reasons. <laughs> so, so she thought of a clever idea. What we show is films of children reacting to movies. So we have, we see, they see children of their age. We did this with four and five-year-olds, which was the youngest we could use. And the kids are either cracking up or they're bored mm -hmm. or they're scared. And then we ask kids, okay, which of these movies do you want to see? The one that, that made the kid do this or this or this? Kids prefer the happy ones, not surprisingly, but they would rather be scared than bored. And, I'd and I don't know how young we could bring that to. Um, but it might be that... So parents automatically assume, for instance, that children like stories with happy endings. You know, the little engine that could. But what about the little engine that tried and failed? I mean, it might be that it, it might it might be that that children will find this perversely satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Well, m movies that that can be very terrifying have endings. Yes. I mean, it's a, an aesthetic whole, and it's this it's finite, so there's a meaning to it. Yes. I think what we what most terrifies human beings is that things may be without meaning. If this fearful event, like Frankenstein, the, the novel and the movie, the, it's, it's compelling and very riveting, and it is frightening, but it has a definite moral meaning, so it has an ending, and then you, you leave the theater, and you've had a, a kind of complete aesthetic experience. That's a moral experience. But if you saw just uh, you know, heaps of, of corpses or lynching or something, and 
just documentary footage and there was no meaning to it, that would not be work at yeah. all. I'm, That'd be I'm terrifying. Not sure. I'm not sure I agree. I mean, there's a classic Unless case. you're sadistic. <laughs> <laughs> In which case, <laughs> sa okay, sadoma you've me. sadomasochistic. <laughs> I mean, Pl Plato gives the example. Plato gives the example of this character. He's going by and he sees a bunch of corpses. And he knows he should keep on walking, for he's no sadist. But he says, my eyes kept dragging me there, pulling me that way. A lot of very popular horror movies don't have meaning in the sense that you're talking about. They're really, there's a serial killer, there's, there's a monster, and in the end, everybody's dead. Really? And I think Every, everybody's dead? Everybody? Okay, usually they might say one of them. <laughs> well, usually in a tragedy, like a formal tragedy of Shakespeare, there are a lot of corpses on the stage, but the younger generation comes on, and, you know, Hamlet is dead, or Macbeth is dead. I don't know these horror movies you're talking about, so they, they don't have any new... And Friday the 13th, the younger generation lives on for the next sequel. The next and then, yeah. And then, and then, yeah. Then, yeah. then they get... But, but that is the rhythm of tragedy, where you're getting rid of an older, corrupt generation, and some, somebody new comes in. There may be a bloodbath, but there's the sense, and maybe this is Darwinian, it's the idea of evolution, that the old has to be uh, eradicated <laughs> and, and, the new, and the new comes in. So that it is both sad and terrifying and tragic, but also there's a sense of renewal. You know, now it's the turn of younger people to yeah. take over. So it's positive in that sense. I, I don't doubt that that could have an extraordinary appeal. I just, I'm not sure it's necessary. I think it's persuasive, though, that, that stories exist to impose a meaning in a meaningless world, or a world we could fear is, is meaningless. And, you know, regardless of the content of the story, the fact that there seems to be an order um, and some sort of organization to the story is, is what we get from the story, and, and you know, that's kind of our nutrition. Um, of course, as literature goes on, and, you know, you, writers begin to distrust um, simplicity of, of stories that were written before, they have to start writing the little train that, tr that tried but couldn't because all the, all the other stories were the, were the train that could. And I wonder if, if in, a, in a way, the um, popularity of fantasy literature now um, is because it harkens back to the older stories that are more traditional in their, in their structure and in their moral and in their, in their endings in a way, and someone like um, W.G. Sabold or something would be more, more difficult mm -hmm. and, and less easy to cope with and, and therefore less, less, less read. Yes, I think that's very true. Yeah. So stories could indeed be a way of exploring the world uh, without these terrible things that you're reading about actually happening to you. Yeah. Uh, so that, that seems to me, a, again, another worthwhile hypothesis. Um, and, you know, enabling uh, the, the kind of argument that Jonathan is, is making to, you know, get some traction there. Um, because if we don't understand the world, then it's uh, less likely that we're going to survive, right? Well, we're going to move to the role of uh, storytelling in evolution, or not. Uh, but first, let's watch a, another short clip. So in your book, you, you, you write about how when we see an abstract pattern, we resolve it into a face, and when we see an a pattern of events like that, we resolve it into a story. So tell us what that was. That's an experiment from the 1940s by psychologists named Heider and Simmel. And what we can do is really quickly kind of replicate the experiment. They showed them 
this uh, short animated film, very simple, and they ask him a simple question, about 120 people. Uh, what did you see? So I'll ask you by a, a show of hands. First off, who saw a story? Okay, a lot of people saw a story. Who saw a story with, keep your hands up, please, uh, until I say something that does not apply to you. Who saw a story with two males and one female in it? Who saw a story where the big triangle was the, was the antagonist? And uh, the, a male antagonist, let's say. Okay. Um, who saw a story of this specific type? A love story. Two, uh, a hero and a heroine struggling against their obstacles to try to live happily ever after. All right. Um, let's, wait, let's lower them down. Let me ask one more question. Um, who saw no story at all? <laughs> a brave man or someone. Okay. That's fascinating. Okay, so what we've done is we've successfully replicated the experiment. What Heider and Seminole found was that only about three people out of 120, three of them, gave a truly reasonable, rational, sort of objective response. I saw triangles and circles moving around on a blank background. That's all I saw. <laughs> Everyone else constructed this really rich, confident narrative. They saw love triangles. They saw soap operas. Uh, most, most common thing people saw was a, was a love story between a man and a woman uh, with the big triangle trying to split them up. But thank goodness it, it ends happily ever after. Um, so I think there's a lot we can pull out of this. It shows that we're natural story. I didn't think that was the same triangle coming back, though, at the end. Oh, it was a new triangle. Okay, yeah. That was a you have a dirty mind. No. Yeah. That he was a guy. Be a novelist. He was a guy down the block coming in. Uh, so, so the question that, I mean, it raises a lot of questions. But the question I'd like to pull out of it is one: uh, we notice there's a lot of pleasure in the room, even watching this really rudimentary fiction. I, I walk, I'm looking out at the room. People are smiling. People are laughing. How do we become this kind of creature who's able to take so much pleasure in even these really rudimentary stories? And to, to, ask, to answer that question, I think. What I'd like to do is run one more experiment, and this one is a thought experiment, okay? So what I'd like people to do is to throw your minds briefly back into the mists of prehistory and imagine that there's only two human tribes living side by side in, in some African valley. Uh, they're, they're in competition for the same resources. One tribe's going to gradually pass away. The other will inherit the earth. They're alike in every way except the way indicated by their names. One is called the story people. One is called the practical people. They both hunt. They both gather. They both woo mates. They both raise their children. But at the end of the day, at some point, the story people get bored and they get tired. And they go back to the village and they throng around the hearth fire and they start making up these wild lies about fake people and fake events. And they have a great time doing it. It's really diverting. But at the same time, the practical people, you know what they're doing? They're out there hunting more, gathering more, wooing more. And they're working harder. Okay, so we know how this thought experiment ends. The story people inherited the earth. They won. Uh, they're us. If those strictly practical people ever existed, they don't anymore. Okay? But the puzzle is, is if we didn't know this at the outset, wouldn't most of us have predicted that those hardworking, practical people would have outcompeted those frivolous story people? The fact that they didn't, that's the evolutionary riddle of fiction. And so I, I guess maybe we could talk about that. Well, I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think visions come to some people. I don't mean all people, but they're visionaries in all cultures, and they're like, they become priests. Mm -hmm. There's a priestly caste. But uh, in the very beginning, there would just be individuals, and I think that these visions have some sort of communal, powerful, semi-conscious significance so that this, what you call storytelling is very much linked to or religious origins and to whether there's a life after death and things that, that are of intense interest to all of us, but we can't confront them head on as logical questions because they would be, they would be re, maybe revealed as nonsense, you know. But if you have a, a creation myth that the whole tribe can, mm -hmm. can kind of... Uh, rejoice in, and then you draw pictures of some of these things. So I, I think just saying that the storytellers come home and they're tired and bored is to diminish the whole you know, profundity of, of the storytelling. So you're saying that the, 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 the tribal stories, the tribal lore, draw the people together around the same values, the same... same well, I guess it must. I yeah. think this is what, what yeah, happens. Yeah, it makes the tribe stronger. Well, that's, and if, you know, yeah, you look at your opinion history. And, and, and then they have the same enemies, and they, they cannibalize the other tribe. And, you know, they're sort of yeah. doing... They're projecting their own yeah. evil out into people over the mountain. Yeah. But the, that makes yeah. them very, very... Uh, 
And what you've just done is a very nice job of, of enunciating one of the scientific theories for why we have story. And it's, and it's also a humanities theory that's been kind of gussied up by the sciences. Will I get credit for that? Yes, I'll cite, I'll cite you from now on. <laughs> I want You're to be a scientist now. I want to be in a footnote. <laughs> yeah. um, footnote, that's but The idea that, that fiction stories are a sort of social glue yeah. that hold a community together, Adhesive. help a community identify itself, define itself, set up standards of behavior, morality, that kind of thing. So you would but say the, that's the evolutionary well, purpose? Well, it's, it's one of the ideas. In, 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 in what are the others? What, what we have is a, a proliferation of ideas, and the experimental scientists have not yet gotten in the game. Uh, and that's what we really need is the experimentalists to get, get, come in and start testing these ideas. What right. they do? So I think, the, I think the, uh, another idea that is going around here, I mean, I like the, uh, the Gottschall uh, new, you know, uh, original creation story. I think that's a good deal better than some of the uh, creation stories that go <laughs> around. Um, but I think what's going on here, you see, as you look at this Hyder and Simmel film, you can't help or a few people can help, but most people can't help hallucinating, you know, onto this, uh, exactly what Jerry Bruner was saying, uh, intentions, chasing, love, uh, and so on and so on. So what I think is really uh, going on, which uh, has become uh, a very important um, mode of investigation, is the idea that what we're doing when we're either telling a story or we're understanding a story, is creating uh, a kind of simulation of the social world. Uh, we could say that stories describe the world, but they're not very good at that. We could say that stories are attempts to persuade people, and yes, I mean, some of them do. But really, what stories are are these simulations of the social world that if you in engage in them enable you to get better at understanding the social world. So, I mean, one of the metaphors that I like is, um, is fiction as the mind's flight simulator. So if you were going to learn to fly a plane, uh, a lot of the time you're up there and nothing happens, right? I mean, I, I mean, maybe in New York, you know, stuff is happening all the time. But uh, I live in Toronto and there's quite a bit of time when nothing much is happening there. <laughs> Um, but, 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 you see, if you allow yourself to enter the flight simulator of fiction, then a lot of stuff happens, and so you can actually get better at understanding the social world, uh, even, uh, uh, e even the, given these provisos that you are putting forward that is not strictly true. You know, I the weather forecast is a simulation that runs on computers. Stories were the very first simulations, and they ran on minds. Now, we do complain if the weather forecast isn't true, but the function is to be able to understand the world and to know whether to take your umbrella. So you're saying and stories make us better social beings. Tell us this, the, about the experiment with the eyes and how that relates. Oh, right. Well, I mean, one of the tests that we've used is that we've measured the amount of fiction that people read and the amount of non-fiction they read. And um, this is one of the tests uh, that we use. It's a test uh, constructed by Simon Baron Cohen. And there are 36 pictures like this of people's eyes as if you see them through a letterbox. And this is a measure of empathy and, and understanding other people's minds. So if, if, uh, uh, what we found is that people who read more fiction are better at this test, even although this test is itself not narrative in any kind of way. So for instance, you see, if you were at a party and you saw someone looking at you like this and you thought she was joking, <laughs> then... then then you may have missed something. <laughs> Did you say Simon Baron Cohen or Sasha Baron Cohen? Because I'm wondering how, well, how serious they are. They're, 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 they're cousins. They're cousins. They are cousins. I was wondering. They are cousins, and they both have vowed never to talk about each other's work. Okay. But I, I, I am not related to either of them, so I could this, talk about this it. This might be Sasha Baron Cohen in the picture. We'll, 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 <laughs> can, can I pass in a more a, a sort of skeptical view about all this? Not yes. I, so about just, storytelling being innate or not? And actually, you have a, a, a distinction, which is I am I'm a strong believer that storytelling and appreciation of stories, capacity of stories, is hardwired, innate, natural, it's part of being human. But 
it's a very separate question to say whether it has a distinct evolutionary history or whether it's an evolutionary adaptation. There are certain things we have that we possess because we possess powerful minds, that we possess a host of capacities, a host of social and moral capacities, and then almost by accident things emerge. So psychologists debate about music, about religion, and about stories. So it's one thing to say um, that both of you may be right. It may well be right that stories are really useful for such and so reason, or for an individual, or stories are very useful for such and so reason for society. But that need not be the reason why it evolved. It, they could have evolved out of capacities that, that, that pre-existed for other reasons. So take the Hyder and Symbol study, the, the, the moving animated characters. I've done some work with babies, with six-month-olds in collaboration with Karen Wynn, where we show babies simple social interactions of characters, and we find that they <coughs> judge them. So a character that helps somebody up a hill is a good guy. A character that pushes somebody down a hill is a bad guy. Babies will reach for the good guy, they'll, they'll, they'll avoid the bad guy. Later on, when they're toddlers, they'll reward the good guy and punish the bad guy. Mm. And this all seems like the ingredients of stories, but actually there's nothing here that's special to stories. What it is is a powerful social mind. When Heider and Simmel presented their data, they didn't say this to stories. They said, look how sensitive we are to social cues. And the morality part, I, it could be, I'm, I'm, I'm just leaving this as a possibility. Everything our mind has, has established, everything we're wired in, is built for truth. And stories are just this wonderful, clever invention that, that emerges when you put all, together, all the ingredients of the mind together. But has, there, were, there was never a point in history where there was the story tribe and the no story tribe. Because there was never a point in history where our minds didn't work to generate stories. But isn't it interesting, you see, that we can now have this discussion once the um, you absolutely know, once the idea of uh, you know let's tr try and think about this scientifically you see absolutely. because this would have been much more difficult to think about you yes. know 50 years ago can we and, and there's an analogous from? discussion for religion which goes exact so people say well religion is good for this reason religion is good for that reason and other people say maybe but maybe another reason why it evolved might simply be because we have a propensity for certain sorts of beliefs because of how our minds work. And, and again, those are the sort of issues which I think are productive. I think data can bear on them. And, and they're very recent to be looking yeah, at them yeah, this way. Yeah, yeah. Are we at the point where we can say why we tell stories, or are we just at the beginning of I think we're very much at the question. beginning. Um, it's only, uh, I can follow the literature back on this in, in the sciences. About, about 15 years it starts to, it starts to pick up as, a, as an active uh, research question. People start generating their own scientific stories. Evolutionaries, evolution is a storytelling discipline. Uh, it always starts with a, with a historical scenario. You make up a, a story about how this might have evolved. Paul is making up a side effect story, uh, an evolutionary byproduct story. Um, Keith is making up a, uh, uh, an adaptive uh, scenario. Um, again, what, what needs to happen is more of what's represented on this stage, which is a pooling of granular expertise from the arts, uh, scholarship, and science, to get at these questions that really are in the borderlands between the sciences and the humanities. And they're languishing unaddressed for the most part, uh, because no one sees it as their jurisdiction. Natural, natural scientists say, oh, it's the arts, that's not my, that's not my ballywick. Um, people in the humanities say, well, I, I don't know how to do any science, and so, uh, uh, so, so what's needed, I think, is a lot more of this sort of thing, so we can start trying to get more definitive answers to these questions. Can I ask you a question? What would be the evolutionary advantage, possibly, of all these apocalyptic myths, at, end of the world, been, over the millennia, there have been many, many very powerful stories of the world ending with great terror and brimstone and so forth. What would possibly be the evolutionary advantage of the recurrence of these I, stories? I think it's a great question, and we don't know. Um, again, this, this is... To me, it's one of the most fascinating things about storytelling in all of its guises, from children's pretend play, you mentioned dreams, to adult fictions. It's that they are much closer to hellscapes than heavens. What, what attracts us about going into hell? I mean, you're describing well, it sometimes they, it's hell. because they tell you how to behave in, in, in light of the apocalypse that's coming, and then that, that binds a community together with, sh with shared conduct. Could be, but we always. also do it automatically. Yeah. Little children do it automatically in their storytelling. It's very trouble-centered. Uh, worlds of uh, developmental psychologists described it as pretend worlds are worlds of great chaos, flux, and mayhem. Um, and that's what you, and we find the same thing in your fiction. You're telling us a story that's a nightmare. To be in that world in real life would be just an absolute nightmare. You're talking our, about my childhood, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, spontaneous stories we tell in dreams. Dreams, dreams are kind of night stories. We have hours of them every night. We're the protagonists. We're facing obstacles. Uh, dream scientists call a dream. This is a conventional uh, definition. A uh, hallucination within a narrative context. Uh, halluc a hallucination within a narrative context. They're night stories. And they're also miserable places to be. You do not want to live in dreamland. Thank goodness dreams don't come true. But I'll, but I'll make one qualification, and it's open for a lot of debate, which is we've been talking right now as if this attraction to trouble, to the hellscapes, exists only in things we know to be fictional. But there's at least some cases where the same appetite happens when we hear about the real world. My 13-year-old was very excited yesterday. He's talking to me for a long time about the zombie guy in Florida who ate somebody's face. He's like, incredibly cool. And then he was even more delighted to hear that somebody in New Jersey threw his intestines at somebody. Um, the, 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 num the number one story of my lifetime uh, that enraptured the most people was the O.J. Simpson trial. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't a, oh, well, if only this were fiction, how interesting it would be. We have some of this appetite and trouble extends to the real world. Yeah. We're, we're almost out of time, but I want to give you each a turn, maybe for about a minute each, to just cast forward a little bit. I, you know, we have uh, uh, social media, some would say, would be a modern version of an ancient urge to tell stories. I mean, in my own online wanderings, which are, which are chronic, um, I feel like I'm making chaos out of chaos. And... Maybe it's the opposite of narrative mm -hmm. for me. And, uh, what I want you each to maybe take just a second to riff on is like, what will storytelling look like at the end of this century? Will there be fundamental changes, or is this an enduring? Should I go first? Uh, yes, you um, go first. We'll go that storytelling way. Storytelling will look exactly like it looks now. Um, there will be evolution, there will be modification, there will be new genres coming and going, uh, but for the most part, story will be as it was, uh, which is a, a character facing a problem and, and trying to overcome. To me, the big Im impressive sort of frontier in storytelling, maybe video games. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, all, it's, a, it's a new form of storytelling where all the conventions are still being com uh, invented. Um, and so what storytelling in video games gives you, if you watch like a video game ad, you'll notice you're watching, for the most part, a movie trailer. And the video game will insert you into the movie. You get to be the rock-jawed hero of that action film. You don't watch it from the outside. You have an interactive experience where you are in the story and uh, you're influencing how it ends. And so like a game like World of Warcraft, you go inside of it, you're entering into a virtual reality space, and you're entering into a very rich story space with a lot of backstory. And people who play this game who get hooked on it, Describe it as being like being inside a, a medieval saga as it's being written, like being an author of a story and also uh, one of the characters. So I think uh, maybe the, the big growth area uh, for, the, for storytelling as an art uh, may be in video games. Joyce? Well, I've never played a video game, but you make it sound very, very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's probably, if the video game could, video game could be... Uh, Increasingly nuanced and, and more more subtle. To find you like the, the Henry James. They don't have to be actual. Yeah. Yeah. The Henry James video game, the James yeah. Joyce game. Right. Um, that I think Emily Dickinson, where you're sort of in, you're immersed in this sort of visual hallucinatory where you're actually in in the game. It is sort of like being immersed in a night in a great 19th century novel where there's a, a great context. So you're probably quite right that the basic formula, which is that there's art is based on conflict, that formula will probably always prevail. Well, I, I have a feeling that being an author is not as much fun as being in World of Warcraft. I mean, it's, more, <laughs> it's more like work than, than kind of play. Yeah. Um, I think where we might be in a hundred years, if I can tell from some of my students, is, is an idea of our, our stories being collaborative, putting something um, on the net that then another person anonymously does something to and changes it. So there's a, the story goes on, and there's not an author. There's um, the, there's well, the idea of genius. That originally, the, stories didn't have one author. Right. So, so we could be going back. back. Yeah. yeah, that'd be interesting. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. But when I, I just have for, um, just happened to be reading an Alice Munro story last night called, called Cortez Island. It's about a young woman who's kind of becoming a writer. She's in a a marriage that's um, perfectly acceptable and new, but she doesn't know, you know, there's hints that it's not going to be great in her life, and um, she begins to read a lot and write, and she gets interrupted now and then in her reading, and, it, and the line is something like, 
um, she would be interrupted at the point of astonishment the book had brought her to, a giddiness of gulped riches. And when I read that, that, that for me, I'm often asked like what I, why I read, and um, it's, it's sort of that, that astonishment that books bring me to and the, the giddiness of gulped riches that, that I get from, from, from reading. So that's going to have to be there in 100 years, whatever form um, it, it takes or is delivered to us in. Keith? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I very much agree with what uh, other people have, have just said now. I mean, I, um, this last year I got invited to a conference, the fourth international conference on digital interactive storytelling, right? So um, I wasn't quite sure why they invited me, but it was nice to, <laughs> it was nice to be there. So I think this is a new uh, genre, and it probably will have many of the qualities that we've talked about. And, and the nice thing about it, you see, is it folds this idea of games back into stories, where, which is what we were arguing might have been some of the genesis of it. And you mentioned, Joyce, the idea of dreams. Well, you see, dreams are very important uh, as well. Um, and it turns out that Shakespeare's term for simulation was dream, right? So A Midsummer Night's Dream was a different world that allows us to see our own world uh, in, not just in terms of the surface behavior, but in terms of what's going on underneath. And I think that element uh, is going to stay there, however much uh, these different genres change. Um, I'll just say I really like the idea of an Emily Dickinson video game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, a room where you, you never leave the room. Right? <laughs> <laughs> great. Great game. We'll make millions. Yeah. Um, uh, the only other thing I'll say, which is I think to somewhat echo uh, Jonathan, which is that artists are notoriously contrary and creative and, and and given a theory that all stories have to be X, they will immediately rush out to do a story that's not X. And given the demands of ingenuity, given a story that, given an idea that everybody wants story that has property X, they will create stories which have don't have that property. And this is true for paintings, it's true for novels, it's true for, for every art form. You always see this, you always see this rebellion against what comes natural. But in the end, if it's true that we enjoy stories because they scratch a universal human itch, this suggests that although the sorts of stories will become infinitely and more and more diverse, still, the stories that people enjoy with pleasure, that willingly and, 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 and joyfully uh, appreciate, will not be all that different from the ones we have now and the ones we had thousands of years ago. I, uh, I, I produce the Moth Radio Hour. The Moth does a storytelling event here at the, at the festival. And um, when we went on the air, people said, there's no way that anyone's going to listen to one person telling a story for uh, 10 to 15 minutes, one voice, no music, no editing, no cutting, no computer-generated graphics. I, uh, and yet, it's become one of the most popular programs on public radio. The Moth here in New York sells out all the time. It's one person. Uh, yeah. It's great. Some of the Moth directors are, are here tonight, and they, <laughs> so they receive your applause. But uh, it's utterly simple and primitive and ancient and, uh, and, and, and gives me a, a kind of hope ab about... Uh, the way story does function for us, that it's really, uh, it, it is elemental. My son Mason, to go back to him, it, when he was first spoke, his, almost his first word was story. And, and then again, story, again, again, story. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking him to see the fireworks on the 4th of July, and he sat in my lap, and we were looking up, and right in front of him, he could see wondrous bursting lights in front of his face and what he said was tell tell the story he wanted to hear still wanted to hear about what he saw uh, we have one more little treat but i i want to thank the amazing participants jeff and <laughs> to have, have been able to sit here and listen to you. And Paul and Keith and Jonathan, I'm just absolutely intrigued with the work you all are doing, and I know we're all eager to hear what your research brings next. Um, 
Yes, clap for that. Please. So we're closing tonight with uh, another representative of those who know storytelling best. This is my story. It begins when two people meet. They were um, friends that were friends for a long time and they were having a play date or kind of like they met in the park. And just so you know, this was the time where they could trade goats and animals for money to produce uh, like eggs so they can eat. And one says, how come you have more goats than me? And the other person says, it is because my father owned the farm. The other father, he worked at a coal mine. Why he didn't have much animals to trade in for money was because he didn't really have time because he kind of was held prisoner. By? Uh, I remember when you asked me if there was a king. There kind of was, yeah, there was. So at the end, very end, what happens is everything good happens at the end. And the kid whose dad is a farmer gives the other kid all of the things like goats and cows so he can be equal with his son. This story isn't finished yet. It will be continued soon. <laughs>